What you got for us? Um, well, uh, the other day, actually it was a couple months ago, but I thought of it again. But there was this quote I saw, and the person was talking to God, and they were like, why do you have to send me through all these hard waters and the troubled times and stuff? And God replies back, he says, because your enemies can't swim. Yeah. And it's like, wow, that's, that, that makes sense. Like, that's, that's such a, a simple answer. Um, and we go through all these hard times in lives, and we don't understand them most of the time. We don't understand why we had to go through them until we see things in perspective, until after the fact that we go through them, then we can see, oh, well, that was a really good thing that I went through because from going through that, I was able to grow as a person and become stronger and help and bless others. Um, and Thomas S. Monson gives this quote, and it's something along the lines of, good timber doesn't grow with ease, the stronger the wind, the stronger the trees. And um, I've always really liked that because if we only experience the good things in life, then we're going to be really wimpy. Mm -hmm. And when the really, really, really tough things come, we are going to not be ready for them. And that's why he puts us through these hard things, because he knows that we can get through them with him. Mm -hmm. So, that's the key, isn't it? Um, I mean, who wants to think about your life being hard? At this point, it's like your whole future is ahead of you. You got these ideas of what your life is going to be like, and it's exciting, you know. And then you've been through some tough times already. Some of you have. Some of you have had relatively, fairly, fairly trouble-free lives, major, major, like, disasters or tragedies. Some of you have experienced a lot of difficult things. Um, but the future, <laughs> I hate to break it to you, <laughs> you can't imagine what's coming at you. It's just hard to fathom, you know, the, the sad things that you'll have to experience and the hard things. And I really appreciate that message because that's absolutely true, Eliza, absolutely true. That you get to see in retrospect, right, the value of having gone through something difficult. But when you're in it, how do you, that's a basic question, how do we keep faithful during hard times? It's easy when it's easy. It's easy to go to church when nobody there is like giving you a hard time about being there or making you feel unwelcome. But then how do you keep going when suddenly it's like, I don't know anybody here. People aren't very nice to me here. What am I supposed to do now? Or when you come into a place in your development where you might find you disagree with something, some doctrine somewhere, or some thing, some story, some, and then you're like, well, what do I do now? This is new territory. Is this still my home? Is this still my place? Is this still my people? You're going to be challenged. Your testimony will be challenged. And not just your testimony, but just like in life. Life is hard. So how do you keep faithful during the hard times? You talked about hard times, but what helps a person be faithful in the middle of it? When you're in it, when you're in the fire, how do you keep your cool? It's always a good idea to um, pray and ask the Lord for help. The so problem is sometimes you don't feel like it. Well, it's you know, it's like you, it. you, you blame the Lord, or it's like, where is the Lord? Just I can pray, but like... I don't see any, any Lord around here because this is really awful. Can't be worse than Job. It, yeah, I guess it can't be. Things could always be worse. So there's, pers there's there, pray for help, absolutely. Well, what you said, you can get through it. The Lord knows you can get through anything with Him. So He's not going to give you anything that you can't handle, ever. We always say, oh, I couldn't handle that if such and such a thing, right? I could never handle that or I, whatever. I mean, we put these little limitations on ourselves, but those are, that's not a great way to talk because you can handle it. Whatever it is, you can handle it with the Lord's help. So perspective is a huge thing. 
isn't it? Did we get these all? Oh, um, who needs? I'll just hand it over. This is, um, a, can we get your signature on here, sir? These are just thank you cards. I refuse. For a couple people. Okay. <laughs> um, okay, praying for help. When you're in the middle of it, if you can pull yourself together enough to get on your knees and actually really beg for help, admit your struggles, admit with your, what you're having a hard time with, and ask for help to show you the way through it. Remember yesterday the question, but what if I don't know how to go through this? What if I'm having a hard time loving? What if I'm not feeling loved? What if all these problems? Well, the answer is always that the Lord will see you through it if you stick by him. So prayer, perspective. What else has helped you get through hard times? What works? Yeah, go ahead. Okay, I, guess. Like, I didn't know if you were just like... Oh, yeah. Smiling or oh, not. Yeah, you're up. Um, personally, whenever I go through something really hard and I'm able to, I focus on something that I need to do better on, and it doesn't necessarily have to be whatever my struggle is. So, like, say I'm struggling wanting to go to church, I will... Uh, distract myself by working really hard at school and just knowing in my head, like not even thinking about going to church, like I already know I'm going to do it and then I will think about something else. Hmm. So like I set um, I tell myself I'm going to do something that I know I should do but I don't necessarily want to do and then I'll distract my brain from overthinking about it and convincing myself out of it. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. So knowing yourself well enough to know what works for you, strategically, like emotionally or psychologically, yeah. Anything else? Yeah. I think that doing service is another way you can kind of get through a difficult time. Like if you're, um, yeah, and just helping out others has a way of um, of helping yourself too. Mm -hmm. Excellent advice. Yeah, get out of your own life for a minute. Like, get out of your own like, uh, like cloud, and go do something for somebody. Switch it up a little bit. That's a really good idea. Any other advice? I think talking, like, sharing how you're feeling and what you're going through with somebody who you trust, it can be really helpful. Because then you realize you're not alone. One of the hardest things about hard times is you sometimes think you're the only one going through what you're going through. That nobody understands. And um, I think that um, just sharing. Having people, oops, thanks for, thanks for your help here. How else can we have you running around cleaning up stuff? Thanks for doing this. For my mom. Okay. Um, yeah, talking. Talking it out with somebody. Helping out, for sure. Yeah, that, that can be very helpful. Uh, you're not alone no matter what you're going through. The Lord is always with you. But people, you also always have people. As much as you can try to convince yourself that you're alone, that nobody understands, there are, you do have people. And sometimes people don't know how to help until you say something. So getting good at talking about what you need and what, what you're, how you're feeling and what you're going through can be extremely helpful. And you need to have an ally. You might try your parents, even though sometimes it's hard to think that they, I don't know, some kids don't have a great relationship with their parents, but actually being open and honest about all of your stuff can be really good. Um, because parents really do love you and they do have experience that can help. Any other advice? How to get through the hard times? Um, let's read us. Let's just let's go to Helaman five twelve. It's an awesome scripture for this. Okay. 
Okay, Emma, can you read that for us, please? Okay. And now, my sons, remember, remember that it is upon the rock of our Redeemer, who is Christ, the Son of God, that you must build your foundation. And when the devil shall send forth his mighty winds, yea, his shafts and his whirlwind, yea, when all his hail and his mighty storm shall beat upon you, he shall have no power over you to drag you down to the gulf of misery and endless woe because of the rock upon which you are built, which is a sure foundation, a foundation whereon if men build, they cannot fall. You've heard that, right? Like a hundred times. So how do you build a foundation upon the rock, which is Christ? What does that actually mean? And what does it mean to not fall? You mean you won't have hard times? So what does it mean to fall or to not fall? And what does it mean to actually build a foundation upon Christ, the rock? What do you think, Levi? Give me. How do you build a foundation on Christ? Um... Well, like, Christ should be your center of life. It should be, like, um, the main thing that you focus on in your life. Um, And so I think building a foundation upon Christ is just having your main beliefs and your your testimony and all that stuff that you need in the church. Um, And that should be your foundation of Christ. And then what I think to fall is... um, to like fall into the devil or um, or unto men because like that the devil can lead you away from Christ and it can destroy your foundation so I think that's what that means Mm -hmm. does it say if the whirlwinds come and the shafts in the whirlwind what is the word that's given there when like it's coming it is coming you are going to have times that are way harder than you would ever want and then you, that you can imagine. Unfortunately, as good as you live, as much as you build your foundation on Christ, this, the, 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 the whirlwinds and the tornadoes and the thunderstorms, they're going to come, even when you're built on that. It's not an escape from the trouble. It's, a way, it's not a way around the trouble. So in some ways, yes, living a gospel-centered life will keep you from a lot of trouble. You'll just avoid it, which is a great idea. Because enough is going to come at you. You don't want to go looking for trouble by making stupid choices. So by living a gospel-centered life, you avoid a lot of the bad. But still, circumstances will put you in very challenging situations. And, it's, and it, I mean, you will be challenged to the core. You will be. So, prioritizing, I heard you say focus. Yeah, I think that's true. Focus on Christ. Temporally, like in, in your everyday life, focusing on what? On Him. Like, how do you do that? Focusing like a target, right? Like you're, like you're aiming at it, and you're trying to shoot at it and hit it. You are trying to aim your life, your life at becoming like Him. Everything you know about Jesus and everything that he's taught, if you actually aim your desires, your thoughts, your actions on trying to become like him, you're focusing on him, that's your target, that's your ultimate goal, that will solve a lot of problems. And when you're in the middle of the whirlwinds and the shafts in the whirlwind and the tornadoes, and when the devil is beating on the gates of your life, trying to drag you down to the gulf of misery and endless woe. He will take you through it, not around it, not over or under it. Like, he will show you the way right through it. For reals. It actually does work. So when you experience... I'm not even going to name it, because it's like depressing, all the sad things that can come into your life. Statistically, you will experience really sad stuff. And Christ will see you through it. So don't abandon his ways. Don't abandon his commandments and his gospel when things get tough. Because we tend, when things are hard, we tend to draw in and like isolate sometimes and lose hope 
and lose motivation. But it's, it, it is focusing on Christ that will see us through it. And I've, I've seen it in my life. Comment? No? Okay. Um, in fact, it's the times that have been hardest for me where I felt closest to Jesus. And that's when I've wanted to do the most good and things have not been working out. When my heart's been in the right place, I've been working for something right, and then it all falls apart. It all just can crumble. And, or just meeting up with resistance that you can't, you can't solve. And in those moments when you are trying to be like him and trying to do what's, what's good, and you're just getting obstacles in the way, and that's when he can show you that, like, I'm with you, and I'm by you, and I know you, I see you. And I'm here to help you. Um, okay, good. So what I, there's, I think we'll come back to this. I'd like to hear more about what you guys feel you benefited from. But there's, I need to mention this because this has been a phrase that's been going through my mind a lot the last couple of weeks as something that I'd like to talk about. A lot of scriptures here, I don't know if we'll have time to read them all, but it's the phrase, take your journey. And it's, it's a phrase that you've read in the Doctrine and Covenants like a number of times between section 35 and 50. This idea of take your journey. So let's read a few scriptures in here. Um, some of you, like... This is your last seminary class of your life. You know, then it becomes institute, and then you continue to learn and grow, right? But some of you are like moving on. In a way, we're all moving on from where we have been. So let's read um, DNC 45, 65 to 66. Who, some read yesterday, some did not read yesterday. I don't remember if it was reading or what. So let's start over here with Charles today. DNC 45, 65 to 66, and 42, 9. Let's read those. Can you read the first one, Charles? And then Emma, 42, 9. And with, one, and with one heart and with one mind, gather up your riches that ye may purchase an inheritance which shall hereafter be appointed unto you. And it shall be called the New Jerusalem, a land of peace, a city of refuge, a place of safety for the saints of the Most High God. Okay? So how do we de describe what Zion is? Let's think about that as we read the next one, too, and we'll put those two those verses together. Emma? Until the time shall come when it shall be revealed unto you from on high, when the city of the New Jerusalem shall be prepared, that ye may gather in one, that ye may be my people, and I will be your God. Okay. So we're talking about Zion, the New Jerusalem. Do we believe in Zion? Are we Zionists? Yeah. Right. Don't we believe in Zion? It's one of the articles of faith. We believe that Zion, the New Jerusalem, we've built up in Independence, Missouri. That that is the place that the Lord has appointed. We still believe that. So at some point, sometime, that's going to be a central place for the happenings in the future where that'll be the place of Zion, a holy city. It's not there yet, but that's in the future. Cool, we believe that. Well, what about until then, what do we believe about Zion? What is Zion? Some, a uh, few words. Uh, give me something, Ruby. What's Zion? It's in Missouri. Huh? Okay, so it's a place, yeah? It's a physical location. That can change. Okay, what else is Zion? There are some words used to describe. A gathering place. Okay, gathering. Yep. And what else is it? If it's, yes? A place of safety. Okay, awesome. Anything else? A land of peace. Peace? A land of refuge. Peace, refuge. Cool. 
I like the words in there where it talks about being one, right? Being unified, being one people, being of one heart and of one mind as we do what Levi Gibby said to try to do as you build, build your foundation on Christ is, is everybody's focusing on one goal, no matter how different our lives are or spread apart we are here, if we're all focusing on getting to one goal, as we do that, what happens to us? As we all walk toward the same point, from wherever we're coming from, we get closer together, right? We come, we become more of one body until we're all surrounding that one point. So we become one as we focus on becoming like Christ. Okay, so that's Zion. Zion can be a place. It can also be a state of mind. It's a, it's a place that we're trying to get to within ourselves, a unity with Christ and with one another spiritually, whether we gather to a place. What about, um, so if we're not gathering to Jackson County, Independence, Missouri right now, where are we gathering to? Church temples. Yes, good, awesome. So Zion gathering, we're talking about temples. We're talking about churches. Yes, exactly. And we're talking about homes and families. Good. I'm glad you understand that. So these verses here are commandments for the saints to move, to go. Well, let's just read one of them. 4564, really. I can paraphrase it. We can just get to it and read it. That's better. Wherefore I, the Lord, have said, Gather ye out from the eastern lands, and assemble ye yourselves together, ye elders of my church. Go ye forth into the western countries, call upon the inhabitants to repent, and inasmuch as they do repent, build up churches unto me. Okay, so he's talking about, he's saying, Go ye forth, right? Those go in the opposite order. So first, he wants them to assemble and then go forth. One, two. So the saints were called to move, to actually like give up their lives, the security of their land, the homes that they had built, the farms that they had cleared the land on and cultivated the crops on. People were living their lives, and and Joseph through Revelation is like, no, we're all going to gather. We're going to assemble ourselves in a certain place. What if that was you? Like, have you been asked to leave your life behind yet? Maybe leave the world behind, right? But really, like, no. You've not been commanded to go anywhere. So they had to leave. So from New York to Ohio was 300 miles. They didn't have cars, right? Most people did it on foot. Have you ever walked 300 miles in really bad shoes? In whatever weather? Carrying what, and what you get to keep is whatever you can carry or push. Or if you have money to buy a horse to pull it for you. Okay, then they went from Ohio to Missouri. That was the next move, a thousand miles. This is a huge undertaking. And the Lord's like, well, people are like, what would you do with our stuff? He's like, well, sell it if you can, or just walk away from it. Just leave it. Leave all of your life behind, and just go out and go live in a field somewhere. They get to Missouri, then that doesn't work out. They end up in Illinois, then they end up in Salt Lake City. They were promised that Jackson is, is the place. It is the place of Zion. So the people... If we can put our, ourselves in their shoes, there's a new gospel that's true. The Lord is gathering his people to come for his second coming. They believed it was happening now. So they had to quickly gather together, build a temple, and then Jesus would come and that would be the end of the world. That's what they thought. They were, there was that urgency to building Zion and to gathering. That's why you're willing to leave anything because you're going to meet Jesus. Like, this is where he's coming. And it's just going to be a small group of us, you know. And that's what they, they thought Zion was. And so they get here. How does it go in Kirtland? 
awful. So then they're like, okay, it'll be better because this is the real Zion. We're going to gather here to the Ohio, and then there will be great blessings poured out upon us. They got a temple there, and then they were, they were but the real Zion is going to be in Jackson County. Edward Partridge gets there. He's like, Joseph, have you lost your mind? Are you seriously? You think this is the place we're supposed to come to? It's on the very edge of the, the United States by that point. It's like Lamanite territory. The only people there are like people who are trying to... It's like brothels and bars is what's in Independence. It's an awful place. Yeah, it's like... And, and they get there and it's like not cultivated. It's not beautiful. It's like, okay, if the Lord's calling me to go someplace, great. I'll go there and the Lord will just pave the way with rose petals. And, and he'll make it easy for us. And we're going to have this awesome life because he's calling us to go to Zion. Right? And they, and they go there like, this is awful. You want us to leave behind everything that we've built and go here? This can't be Zion. Go back. Go, Joseph, go check with the Lord again. I think there's a mistake. And they got it seriously into arguments. It's like, this doesn't make sense. I can't ask people to leave their homes and come and live here. No. And he's the bishop, and he was a man without guile. He was very honest. And he's like, I, this doesn't make sense. Zion is supposed to be something beautiful and something great. And it's not. It's just not. There's nothing here. This is very applicable to us. Because as the Lord calls us to go from place to place to take our journey, we somehow expect that if we do what he says to do, that it's all going to be roses. That it's all just going to be great. That he's bound to bless us. And life will be great if we just do what he says to do, right? If we take our journey and go. And then you get there and you find out, okay, I went on a mission. I, I did what you wanted me to do. And I kind of hate my mission. Like, I don't get all of the mission president. And my companions are just not nice. And nobody wants to hear what we're doing. All we're doing is, like, on Facebook all day. Like, or mucking out somebody's corral because we're just trying to find some way to give service because we can't teach people. Like, oh, well, I went on my mission, but Zion isn't what I thought it would be. Or, okay, like, okay, I'm going to go to school and I'm going to follow my heart and get my career going. And then you do that and you can't get a job anywhere. Well, I'm like, what'd you leave me to Zion for? What'd you leave me to the place I was supposed to go? I was trying to do what you wanted. Or you get married. And you're like, oh, you realize after a while? Marriage. This is really hard. This is hard. This is hard business right here. Wow. I didn't imagine we'd be like, okay, but we'll have kids and my kids are going to love me and it's going to be great. We're just going to play and be happy, a happy family. And then you have your kids and you're like, kids are great, but sometimes they don't like you very much as a parent because you, whatever, and you're not perfect and they're not perfect. And so family life is just really hard and it's supposed to be Zion but it's just like this place where what is there here so the point of this all is that the Lord will carry us from place to place you are not meant to stay where you are the Lord is calling you and me always to take our journey to the next place he does not want you to stay stationary in your development continually the Lord will push you and pull you and prod you along to the next place of development on your journey to become all you're meant to become. And that is that necessarily means difficulty. Thank you for bringing this up this morning. It's so appropriate. The Lord calls you on your journey, and that journey is hard. And the destination is something that you have to build. He's not going to build it for you. He didn't give them an amazing city to just go take over that was already built. And like, send the inhabitants out. And you guys just move right on in to these amazing farms and houses that are already built for you. This is Zion. Welcome. Come right on in. It's like you go there and there's nothing there. And you have to build it. You have to build. You have to make your mission what, is, what, what it is meant to become. It's not going to be given to you. You have to make your education what it is meant to be. It's not going to be handed to you. You have to make your marriage what it's meant to be because it's not just going to happen. You have to create your family, the culture that you want and the way you want your life. You have to build it because there's nothing there to start with except bare ground. 
That's all you get to start with. So as you take your journey, be prepared for that. Don't be surprised. Don't let it rock your boat when you get to where you think you're going and it just does not seem like what you thought it'd be. It's okay. It's meant to be that way because you have to build it from scratch. It's not going to be just given to you. If you're not happy with your young women's group, with your elders' quorum, with your ward, build it. Make it what you believe it can be. Build Zion. Zion will not be handed to us. And it won't be handed to you. You have to build it. The Lord will tell you to go there. And he'll help you build it. He'll give you instructions. But it's your work to do to build Zion. Whatever, you know, Zion in quotes. Like any good thing. And if you think you're going to stay where you are because it's more comfortable, that place will rot. You will rot and die there if you're not willing to take your journey. You have to be willing to be open to going into the unknown if you're going to do the Lord's work. You have to be ready to leave it behind and be like, okay, I will go with faith. I have no idea what it's going to be like and it's going to be hard, but I'm being called and, 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 and inspired and impressed to do this. Go talk to that person. Go share with this. Go build that. I've got a friend, um, well, we experienced it in our own life, basically. Take your journey to go to Africa as a family. Leave it behind. Okay. Another friend of ours had a nice life in Rose Park in Salt Lake City. Made him good money and got an impression, we got to move. Like, I don't know where we're going to go, but we've got to move. We've got to get out of this place. For our family's sake, we have to move. So they just up and took their journey, moved to St. George from Salt Lake City. Didn't know anybody there. I have another friend, okay, who right now, in fact, the Lord in the sacrament meeting whispered to his mind the name of a city in a state that he'd never been to, and he knew that they had to move there. And it's been a year and a half. He's like, making all these pros and cons lists, like, should we go? I'm like, what are you doing? Like, it's awesome that you know that you have to move and where you're going to go, that's a huge bonus because a lot of people just know they have to go and they don't know where they're going to go. It's just like you need to change. And so he's struggling a lot with taking his journey because it means a lot. It's a huge sacrifice and it's scary to go into that, especially when you've got kids, like a whole family in tow and it changes their whole life when you move. So it's going to be scary to take your journey, but don't try to live in comfort. Don't try to stay where you are, because you will not grow. You won't achieve what the Lord wants you to achieve. You won't become what you're meant to become. So, as hard as it is, like, you're going to be on the move. And you have to build it up. Um, That's the message that I think I had to deliver to you today. And it's been good for me to review it and to feel that again. Um... You know, in this class, this is the last class we have. And I know that every day I've borne my testimony to you, but I haven't said, I know this, right? I don't usually speak in those terms, but I've not taught you anything in here that was that I did not feel was true, that I could verify in my own life experience. I'm not just a talking head for the manual to deliver names and dates and places to you to just tell you stories so you know them. What I try to teach you is what I have experienced and what I have learned from the scriptures in my own life. So everything I've told you is my testimony because I believe it and I've lived it. So I don't have to say I know that that Jesus is the Christ. I can say focus on him and things will go better in your life. That is a testimony. It's a statement of fact that I know is real because I've lived it. So every day I've testified of truth in here. I've felt the Holy Ghost in this class with you. Many, 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 many times. And I know that that is the Lord testifying of truth in here. I hope that your testimonies have grown, meaning your understanding of truth and your commitment to live it. Because we've been taught together by the Spirit in here. Um, And I've done my best. And I've not 
done perfectly. But I've tried my best to teach you. And I love you guys a lot. Um, and I'm really happy to have the chance to have spent this time with you. It's been sweet, and it's been hard, and it's been amazing. And I'm really grateful for your faithfulness. Truly I am, that you show up here, and you try your best to be engaged and stay awake, and, um, and I, just, I just honor you for your diligence. Because I know you're here, not because of me, because I can teach you, but you're here because you are trying to focus and build your foundation on Christ. And I know that he will reward you richly for that effort. And I hope that I can be a resource to you if you ever need a sounding board, if you ever have questions or doubts or concerns or you're struggling, like I am making myself available to you as an additional resource in your life that you can reach out to me if you need to talk or if you need support or if you're having a hard time. I am available and I'm willing to be a lifelong friend to each of you. And maybe someday that could be useful to you. And I leave this with you in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. I wish we had more time, you guys. Really, I do. I'd love to hear from each one of you, but time has been not my friend in this class. So, who did I ask? Dear Heavenly Father, we are also very thankful for all of our many blessings. We're so very thankful for the opportunity that we had to come to seminary this morning. And we're so very thankful for Brother Jones and for the time and the effort that he puts into each lesson. So we're very thankful for thy gospel and for thy son, Jesus Christ, and for the atonement. Heavenly Father, at this time, we ask a blessing that we will have thy spirit to be with us and that we will remember thee and do the things that thou would have us do. And we ask a special blessing upon all those who are sick or afflicted or in need of comfort at this time. And we say these things in the name of thy son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you, Eva. Tomorrow, 6.30, Seminary Social combined. Be here. It's the last day of seminary. Come on. What's that? Yeah. So, yeah, we, we decided not to have us a regular class and they'll make it a social. So, I know it's early, but be here. Be happy. Okay. It's breakfast. It's food. It's breakfast. It's early sometimes to be breakfast. We'll be all right. We need to take our boxes. Oh, yes, yes. No, yeah. Take your box. Definitely take your box. I don't know if you build all the boxes. Yeah, I'm going to stack up a bunch of boxes. On them. I, I've got you written on my heart. I don't, I don't need that box. Look at all the good stuff. Put it in my car and I'll put it there. Yeah. <laughs> For the rest of my life. Yes. Um, hey guys, so your boxes are 